Property X Factor is brought to you in association with Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store, and Yezu Muse & Co. Japan. And welcome to the first episode of the UK's very first TV programme dedicated entirely to amateur radio. This is the TX Factor and I'm Bob McCready, G0 FGX. In this episode I'm reporting from Paul Dew here in Cornwall. I'm at the Marconi Centre where in 1901, with the aid of a huge antenna and a 20,000 volt spark, a certain Signor Marconi bridged the wild Atlantic Ocean by radio for the first time. And I'm Nick Bennett, 2E0 FGQ. A little bit further north than Bob, but with some equally stunning views to enjoy, if a little windy today. I'm on Stiper Stones, a hill dominating the skyline to the southwest of Shrewsbury in the heart of England and close to the Welsh borders. I ventured this high to prove that with antennas, size isn't everything. What really makes a difference is how high you can get it and how being part of the Summits on the Air award scheme can keep you fit and get you some big signals from some stunning locations. And I'm Mike Marsh, G1IAR, a little bit further up the coast than Bob, in the beautiful seaside town of Sidmouth, East Devon. This is the Norman Lockyer Radio Group and home of special event call sign GB2NLO. Thanks guys. Well, up here on the windy cliff tops at Poldu in Cornwall, is not the kind of place you expect to find a huge granite memorial. But this particular man-made addition to the stunning landscape is to remember a radio pioneer, Marconi. Now, it's all right as granite memorials go, but you do have to hike up to the cliff tops here to see it. But there is another memorial to the great man just over here. And this one is a living, interactive tribute to the father of radio, the Marconi Centre home of the Poldu Amateur Radio Club and built on the historic site of Signor Marconi's amazing achievement of bridging the Atlantic by radio for the first time. On December the 12th, 1901, Marconi was at Signal Hill, Newfoundland, where he successfully received the letter S in Morse code sent by the massive spark transmitter that he had built on this windy Cornish cliff. Or did he? There's still some controversy on that point to this very day. So, did he or didn't he? Well, let's head inside the Marconi Centre now because waiting for us is a man who thinks he knows the answer to that question. Keith, oh. hello. Hello, Bob. Well, what a stunning location this is yeah. for a radio club. How long has it been here? Uh, this building was opened uh, to celebrate the centenary of the first transatlantic transmission uh, in 2001. But it's so much more than just a radio club, isn't it, Keith? I mean, it is an informative, interactive visitor's centre. Can anybody just turn up and have a look? Uh, yes, the uh, club are here every Tuesday and Friday evening from about 7pm. And uh, the centre is open every Sunday afternoon from 1.30 until 4.30. Uh, we, you can check our website to uh, get more details of the opening times and contact details for arranging a visit. That's great. And of course, you can always check our show notes at thetxfactor.co.uk for more information. Now, Keith, the important question here, did Marconi really manage to send that letter S winging its way across the Atlantic Ocean? Because the scientific community at the time were pretty sceptical, weren't they? They thought that the radio waves couldn't follow the curvature of the Earth because that's what the math said. Yes, there was some doubt initially, but the uh, scientific community very quickly came round to the idea that it had been successful. Uh, Marconi had no idea how he'd managed to, um, to succeed in the transmission. Uh, he was working on an empirical formula uh, where the height of the aerial was increased, the power was increased, and the range increased accordingly. They knew nothing really about how propagation works over long distances, did they? In fact, the reason he chose Paul Dew to Newfoundland was because he thought it was the sea path, it was the salt water that would make it go round the curve. Yes, he thought it was the conducting medium of the salt water. In fact, in 1899, he took the opportunity of going over to the Great Lakes 
and seeing if he got the same results with fresh water, uh, which of course he did. Uh, uh, there was no knowledge, of course, of the ionosphere or anything like that at the time. Uh, the effect of sunspots, for instance, was unknown. Uh, in fact, he was very, very lucky. He chose uh, almost the shortest day. Uh, the transmission that finally got across was at four o'clock in the afternoon, Poldew time, 1.30 p.m. Newfoundland time, and he was getting very close to sunset. Uh, the other thing was that it was a sunspot minimum, so the D layer was very, very weak at that point at that time, and uh, all these things came together to mean that he actually did succeed in transmitting the signal. So you would say, Keith, then, that it was a series of happy coincidences that he wasn't really aware of that made it possible, because a lot of the doubters have talked about the frequency used, first of all, because it was sort of slap bang in the middle of medium wave. He thought, or they thought, the antennas were tuned to about 366 metres. Um, and they had a massively powerful spark transmitter here, huge antennas. But at the other end, in Newfoundland, the receive setup was pretty crude, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, he was relying on a kite antenna, which was swinging around all over the place. Uh, the weather was very similar to Paul Dew's weather. And uh, he was very, very lucky, in fact, uh, considering that he only had a very, very crude uh, receiver using a coherer. A co what? Uh -huh. A coherer. Well, we have one over here if you'd like to come across and have a look. This is, this is the piece of kit that's going to demonstrate this for us. This is the coherer demonstration. That's the coherer itself. So, that, what, what exactly is that, Keith? Uh, it is just two metal contacts with some metal filings in between. That's all it is. And when you send a radio signal through those filings with our spark transmitter here yeah. and ah. you see you get a signal. So what happens is the radio signal makes them kind of line up and stick together yes. to cohere. They cohere, they stick together. Uh, you've got a DC path then and that's what the meter is showing. The only problem of course is you then have to decohere them and Marconi by that time had organized a system where he had a, an electromagnet, almost like a bell, without the bell, that would tap and it, that would tap it ah. and that would make the thing ready for the next, whoops, for the next signal. So okay. in other words, if I get this right, the big yeah. difference then is you're not even really listening to the radio signal. It's a kind of a, a, a relay that is affected by the radio signal that switches and that would put a click in your headphone and a mark on your more sinker. Absolutely, yes, yes. Uh, you're relying on the DC conduction here, which you can then use to work a Morse in inker, or to, as you say, to make a, a click in the headphone. So how can we be sure then, with this very crude receiver, that it really was the letter S that's triggering this coherer? Could it not have just been a series of static crashes out there over the Atlantic? Yes, the dit 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 of the letter S is a, a very recognisable signal. Uh, the chances of that being static were very, very small. In fact, Marconi was using the S right from his very early days because he realised that it was very, very easy to recognise in amongst the inevitable static uh, crashes. Even after Marconi announced his success, though, there were still doubters, weren't there, in the scientific community and in the press. So how did he finally silence those doubters? Well, in February 1902, he returned to the United States on the SS Philadelphia, which was rigged with an excellent antenna system. And he had a Morse Inca, and every evening the captain of the ship went down and actually signed the tape with the latitude and longitude at the time. Uh, that gave them a range of something like 1,500 miles, which was certainly enough to satisfy any remaining doubters. So there could be no question. Now it's signed off by the captain of the Philadelphia, right. it's official, but we're still quite a long way from a commercial service at that point. Absolutely. Uh, it wasn't until 1907, in fact, that Marconi managed to get two very, very powerful stations, one at Clifton in Connemara, the other one at Glace Bay in Nova Scotia, 
and to get a successful 24-7 telegram service which undercut the, um, the cable companies and rapidly made Marconi and the company very, very rich indeed. But this is where it all started, isn't it? You can't underestimate the importance of Paul Du because whichever way you look at it, the Paul Du transmitting station was where the letter S emanated from that went across the Atlantic. And then the final proof with the Philadelphia, it was Paul Du that they were communicating with. Yes, you have to say, this is the place where it all began. And what a fantastic, living, interactive memorial we have to all that was achieved here in the Marconi Centre. This is all that's left of Marconi's original building that housed the transmitters here. But his work lives on because there's no doubt that this beautiful part of Cornwall played a crucial role in persuading Marconi's investors that long distance radio communication had a commercial future. And of course, it has an important role in amateur radio today as the home of the Poldu Amateur Radio Club, who work very hard to tell the incredible story of Marconi's Atlantic Leap, both to visitors to the Marconi Centre and to radio amateurs around the world. This is the FTDX 1200, the latest addition to the Yezu family of fine transceivers. It really looks great. The 4.3-inch TFT widescreen full-colour high-resolution display has a wide viewing angle, selectable display sources and a spectrum scope to give you all the information you need to get the best out of this amazing radio. In the March 2014 Radcom, Peter Hart said in his review, the FTDX1200 is another good all-round radio with good overall performance within its price bracket. Additional optional accessories make the FTDX1200 a truly flexible, high-performance radio. See the Yezu FTDX1200 now at Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store. And remember, there's a cash-back offer of £83 when you buy a new FTDX1200 from any approved European Yezu dealer until the end of March 2014. See website for details. Even better, add TXF1200 to the discount code box on the ML&S website and get free carriage to UK mainland and free Yezu goodies. Now from big antennas at sea level to smaller ones as high as you can get them. Whether you are happiest in the shack or out operating portable, the Summits on the Air scheme has something for everyone, as Nick Bennett discovered. It's nine o'clock on a cool and drizzly Saturday morning in November, and Tom, M1 EYP, is preparing to ascend Stiper Stones, one of the tallest peaks in Shropshire, in an attempt at activating the summit as part of the Summits on the Air award scheme. SOTA has been a popular challenge for radio amateurs for over a decade. So what's the attraction for this maths teacher from Macclesfield? The person that uh, alerted me to SOTA was SOTA's first mountain goat, Alan, uh, Alan Poxon, M1 EYO, next call sign to mine, coincidentally. Um, and he contacted me and explained about this SOTA thing, and it appealed to me because I was always interested in, in hilltopping as a, as a shortwave listener, so the idea of going up hills to do radio uh, seemed a very natural thing for me to do, and I've always loved hiking in the outdoors anyway. Um, I've, I had a, a young family at the time. This was an ideal way to, for, to get myself and me two lads um, out on the hills and with a, a regular focus on, on a weekend. Um, and, and one of those one of those lads is, is now a fully licensed army to himself and also a Sota Mountain Goat. Ah, so you see the uh, the trig point just peeping out of the mist on the on the top of the rocks there. Now we come more clear in a few metres time. I have no intention of going to the top of there to set my radio gear up. There's no need under the SOTA rules, which allows uh, activation within 25 metres vertically. Um, so I'll take advantage of that today, because I think it's going to be quite greasy on them rocks, and I'm, I'm not too great with exposure either. And here we are at the summit. It uh, looks a reasonably sheltered spot to set up in just here, underneath the trig point. And uh, I'll, get, I'll get set up. SOTA activations can be attempted on any band and by using any mode and power that your licence allows. So what's the biggest challenge to a mobile operator 536 metres up and far from the comfort of the nearest Starbucks? In, re in regard to the choice of bands, what, I, what I'm doing at the minute is it's all 12 metre band because there's a 24 megahertz challenge 
uh, taking place in Sota at the moment that I'm, I'm very keen on. So if I fancy making lots and lots of uh, CW contacts, then I'll do 20 metres. If I want to work interesting DX, I might go to 10 metres or 15 metres. If I want to work my friends up and down the UK and Ireland, it'll be 80 metres. If I want to work my, the Sota chasers across Europe, then it'll be 40 metres. So what about sustenance? How do you keep your energy levels up? Soup every time. With soup, it's hot, it's liquid and it's food. Today we have uh, Moroccan chickpea soup. So that's, uh, that's lunch today. Hmm, appetising. But what about power levels? Uh, the power I'm running uh, at the moment is, is 5 watts, which is uh, standard for the Asu FT817. But certainly on CW, on these HF bands, when the, when the bands are open like this, it's uh, more than enough. Uh, just a few days ago, with this set up on this power, I worked uh, two stations in Australia from the Sota Summit. So that's the four contacts. Uh, there was two Whiskey Zero JYN on 2 metres FM. And then we've had a Portuguese station, one from the Kilainingrad part of Russia, I think, and uh, a G4. We're not sure how close or how far. But that's four contacts, three on 12 metres CW, one on two metres FM. So the two points are qualified for, for the hill. And see how many more we can make now for the 12 metre challenge. CQ Sota, CQ Summits on the air. Mike 1, Echo, Yankee Papa, Portable on Stiper Stones. Sota reference, Golf, Whiskey, Bravo, 003, QRZ. OK, thank you, Tony. Thank you very much for the SSB contact. Uh, name here, by the way, is Tom. Tango Oscar Mike. 7-3. Ciao, ciao. So what comes next? I'm about to uh, start on PSK 31 on the 12-metre band. So the rig's uh, on a frequency of uh, 24.920 uh, with the adjustment on the, uh, on the software. The frequency is actually 24.9215. And I'm transmitting in PSK31 mode uh, using my smartphone as a computer and using uh, this little black box as the, as the uh, digital interface. I'll call CQ. Uh, a few moments ago I programmed in the SOTA reference uh, Whiskey Bravo 003. So the computer knows to mention that now when calling CQ. Something there, very weak. Ah, there we go. M1 EYP stroke P, M1 EYP stroke P, D, U, A, 1, C, A, S. Yeah, I'm now transmitting back to United Alpha 1, Charlie Alpha Sierra, uh, with a macro message uh, that gives him a report and tells him my SOTA reference. That's uh, Victor from Pryazersk. I'm sure that's not how you pronounce it. And uh, that's somewhere in Russia. It's a United Alpha 1 prefix, so it's somewhere in European Russia. Now we're putting on the, uh, a, a two-metre antenna. This is uh, the Sota Beams MFD, multifunction dipole. And I like to uh, mount it vertically for omnidirectional takeoff. And I like to mount it as high as possible, which is why I'm putting it on the, on the Sota pole. This is going to be a, a rare excursion for myself. I normally stick to HF and normally my son Jimmy, Mike Zero Hotel Golf Yankee, will be taking care of the, the VHF part of our activations. So I'm on my own, so I'm going to do a bit of two metres at the end of my activation because there's always a few people want the summit on two metres. Hope I'm not speaking too soon. CQ, CQ2, CQ2 metres, CQ2, CQ2, mic 1, Echo, Yankee Papa Portable. Mic 1, Echo, Yankee Papa Portable, summits on the air from the summit of Stiper Stones, Golf Whiskey Bravo 003, CQ Sota and by. 2E0XYL, uh, very good morning Karen. You are 5 and 9, 59 onto summit of Stiper Stones, Whiskey Bravo 003, QSL. Weather-wise, I must just be in the middle of it here because I've been looking at the webcams in the Lake District and it looks very, very overcast up there. So uh, we just got a temporary good spot. Um, two E zero X Y. I'll say seventy three because there's other stations waiting, Karen. But always nice to speak to you. Thank you. 
Okay, the activation is now complete. 32 contacts in the logbook. Time to go to another hill, time to descend. Off we go. 7-3. So if you would like to find out more about summits on the air and the wide range of qualifying hills and mountains in the UK and indeed throughout the world, or whether you prefer to chase the activators from the comfort of your warm and cosy shack, then you can find out more by going to the SOTA website. The address is on the screen. Or you can check out the show notes at txfactor.co.uk. Well, I'm going to hang around here now uh, and enjoy this amazing view. But I have a sneaking suspicion that with all those telescopes around, Mike Marsh might just have the edge on me at the moment. Thanks, Nick. Well, you're absolutely right. I can definitely see further into the distance than you can using one of these little babies. But I'm not here to stargaze right now. We're here to have a look around the inside of the Norman Lockyer Observatory at Sidmouth in East Devon, one of the premium amateur radio and astronomical sites in the UK. Sir Norman Lockyer was born in Rugby in 1836 and died in Salcombe Regis in 1920. As a scientist, he was credited with being the man who discovered the element helium after making observations of the sun back in 1868. After his retirement in 1913, he established an observatory near his home, which was initially called the Hill Observatory, but later renamed the Norman Lockyer Observatory after he died. Today, the NLO is owned by the East Devon District Council and run by the Norman Lockyer Observatory Society. The observatory is a really busy place now with so much stuff going on here. They've got numerous domes and telescopes, including Sir Norman Lockyer's original telescope. Not only that, there's a radio station here that would make you green with envy and an on-site two metre voice repeater. And that's exactly what we're here to see today. The other thing is um, there are lots of other bits to go with it as well. So, um, um, so we've taken our coats off. We're in the warm, indoors, in the radio room of the GB2 NLO amateur radio station. Also here is the two metre voice repeater. And I haven't got a clue how it works. Luckily, I'm here with the repeater keeper, Dave Lee, G6 XUV, and he's got a very good idea of what's going on. So Dave, hi, hi nice Mike. to meet you. Um, first things first, how on earth do you go about getting a repeater on the air? What do you do? Exactly, it's um, a matter of paperwork really. Okay. Uh, application to Ofcom, uh, who send it on to a group called the UK Repeaters Group, and then you wait. Hopefully, uh, within six months, you might get your go-ahead. Sometimes it can take a lot longer. We were lucky. Uh, the repeater moved here from a nearby location, uh, so it didn't take quite so long. Uh, we took about three months and we were on the air. When it comes to like buying the equipment, maintaining it, who pays for it all? Well, fortunately, we have a benefactor, a uh, local amateur manages to obtain this equipment from ex-ambulance service use. Uh, he's a very good uh, expert at converting it. And uh, we then uh, use the equipment from him uh, and uh, it's up and running. Fortunately, on the site we are at the moment, uh, the costs are borne by the society. So uh, there are actually no running costs as such. One of the big changes with repeaters, I remember when I was young, when I first was licensed, um, you had to access a repeater with uh, a 1750 hertz tone. That's kind of all changed now. It's all uh, CTCSS. How do you, um, how does that become a part of the, the, the repeater electronics now, the CTCSS, all the access side of stuff? You've got your transmitter receiver parts of the repeater and then we have a logic board. This is uh, an AMCON uh, RC210 board that we have, fairly old board. Uh, it does the job very, very well. Uh, that's got the electronics on board and with some software, just ordinary laptop software, we can manipulate that and make it do all the requirements. Uh, we set a CTCSS tone of 77 hertz on this one, uh, so unless you're running that access tone, you won't get in. When you're using a repeater, and there it goes now, um, when you're using a repeater, it's actually transmitting and receiving at the same time. How do you stop one part in interfering with the other part? Well, lots of ways of doing that. You can either have a two aerial installation, right. and you need some separation in between the antennas, or we run a single antenna uh, installation, and what we've got here on the ground uh, under the repeater are, are cavities. 
Uh, they're actually converted beer barrels. They're Seriously? Actually, yeah. <laughs> you can, they're not left over from the Christmas party. Uh, they're converted uh, beer barrels and they, they are coaxial capacitors and they actually work for the separation of the receive and input uh, or well, the input and uh, transmit frequencies. And they're really well shielded between each other, I guess. I yeah, mean, it's a yeah. massive metal barrel, isn't it? Yeah, they're quite well uh, engineered and uh, they're set up regularly to make sure they're on frequency and doing the job they need. And what about, uh, what about maximum power output here for the repeater? How much power can you actually run? Um, we, uh, we run 25 watts from the transmitter. Uh, we check that regularly, make sure we're on uh, the power output. Uh, we're probably running about 20 watts by the time it gets up the coax to the antenna. 20 watts maximum. Now, um, this probably sounds like a really stupid but an obvious question. What happens if you have a power cut? Have you got, are you covered for like power outages? Uh, the repeater is uh, automatically on battery. It, uh, it tends to run on battery all the time with the power, side, power supply just topping the battery up. So it just continues to work. Okay. Uh, we have a 20 amp uh, battery that runs it and it'll run for about eight hours with no problems. Right. Yeah, because everybody expects a repeater to be on the air all day, all night, never off. And there's a lot of people complaining if it goes off the air, where is it? but they're getting it for free too. Exactly. Well, possibly. Um, personal question, I guess. Um, when you're the repeater keeper of a repeater and you've got your own um, Ofcom license, do you need to apply for anything else um, with Ofcom because you're running a repeater? Does that need a separate license? Uh, no, it's just a uh, variation of my license. It's an NOV of my license. Uh, you have to apply and you also have to um, have certain information that you uh, supply to Ofcom in, by way of how you shut the repeater down. So if we ever have a problem with the repeater, I have a list of people, if I'm not in the area, that can come on site within 20 minutes and shut the repeater down. Uh, and what we do, we actually have a log book uh, that we maintain, which gives details of uh, power outages, shutdowns, and I also put things when I've modified the repeater right. on here. Here's another thing I was thinking of, right? Um, People messing around, mucking about on repeaters, what can be done to stop them? Well, we're very lucky actually where we are that we don't suffer that <laughs> very often. Um, normally, the first thing to do would be to just completely ignore any misuse. Um, we do have ways of monitoring the repeater. I have ways of shutting the repeater down remotely if necessary. Um, but uh, normally, you would ignore anybody who gives you any problems on the repeater and they'll normally go away. Good advice, I like it. Um, and I guess. One last thing, we, we've heard the Morse ident go out a couple of times, but I haven't seen the repeater being used yet. So can you make it make some noise and see if anybody's there? Uh, G6 XUV is listening through. Wonder if anybody's there. Would appreciate a signal report, please. Goodness me, there's a pile up. Uh, thanks, Dave, uh, M6KVJ. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, the other station, not sure what your call sign was. Would you like to go ahead, please? Yeah, fine, John. Bit of interference on you there, but uh, excellent stuff. OK, thanks very much for that. That's 736XUV. Nice to see the uh, repeater being used with a couple of people on at the same time. Good stuff. Um, one last question I was thinking of. Is it going to cost me anything if I want to use the repeater? How much do I have to pay? No, nothing at all, Mike. Uh, all amateur repeaters are free of charge. Fantastic. Free, that's a good price. All right, Dave, thanks for that. That's been really interesting. Hopefully, everybody's got a little bit of an insight into exactly how a two-meter voice repeater works, and we'll know what happens when they key the mic to go through one. There's a Yezu radio to suit the interests of every kind of ham. And you can see the whole range at Martin Lynch & Sons. Our expert staff can help you choose the Yezu that's right for you, whether your passion is portable operating, mobile or DXing. Yezu have a radio to suit your interests and your budget. Whatever kind of ham you are, Yezu have the radio for you. You'll find them all at the best prices, backed by our legendary customer service at Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store. And now on TX Factor, it's back to Bob on a windy hill somewhere in Somerset. 
The great thing about amateur radio as a hobby is you can take it with you wherever you go. For example, on my way in to walk the dogs now, I was able to work the local repeaters. And when I get out and walk from here, I can take my handheld with me and maybe do even a miniature SOTA because I'll be able to work UHF and VHF stations much further afield than I usually can. Now, there are so many facets to this amazing hobby and we want to reflect them all on the TX Factor. So we want to hear from amateurs from up and down the UK and around the world. Has your club or organisation done something that you think would make a great feature for a future edition? Or maybe you already have some good quality video of individuals, organisations or your club taking part in interesting amateur radio activities. Now to contact us you'll find the show notes and uh, full details of this episode and of course our contact details at txfactor.co.uk. We want to reflect the true diversity of this hobby, everything from friendly chats to cutting edge science and technology, here on the only UK TV show dedicated entirely to amateur radio. Okay, time to let those dogs out. Come on guys, how'd you come? Come on, come on, this way, come on, this way. Golf Zero, Foxtrot Golf X-Ray, portable, listening through SW. Uh, G Zero, FGX, portable, listening through SW for any call. G0FGX from G1IR. How's that dog walking actually going, Bob? I hope it's not the dogs that are walking you. Listen, I've got to go, but I've just had some really great ideas for the next episode of the TX Factor. 2E0FGQ. Hi, guys. I've been having a few thoughts, too. How about linking up with the International Space Station? Or perhaps the TX Factor is brought to you in association with Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store, and Yezu Muse & Co. Japan. <laughs> <laughs>